Hello and welcome everybody to our DevNet event. Um, we're extremely excited to be able to have a, a great uh, number of speakers that we have today. Um, we have some amazing uh, DevNet gurus from the US uh, and Australia. A um, little bit of housekeeping before we kick off. Uh, if you can keep muted, that would be great, unless you're asking questions. Uh, we do have a Q&A that you'll see on the bottom uh, right-hand side. So really, please ask as many questions that you have as we are going along. Um, there's, uh, yeah, and um, I think on that note, we are we're gonna we're gonna kick off. I'm gonna hand over to Mandy, and wow, so excited to have you here. Let's um, yeah, let's get on with it. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, I should be sharing. Uh, let me know if you can see the slides. Are we looking good there? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, you can hear me okay? A little housekeeping check. Yep. Yeah, all good? Fantastic. Um, well, thank you, everybody, for being here today. We are really excited to be able to share some of the things that we've been working on in DevNet and also in our Cisco training and learning, and really how that's coming together to enable new use cases around automation, um, how workforces are transforming to meet a lot of the new demands. And we're gonna take you through um, showing off some of those new things that we're working on, diving into some really interesting demos. And please use the chat and the Q&A. The more interactive, the better. Um, we may not be able to get to all the questions, but we will try our hardest, and we will. We can also follow up afterward as needed. So, um, if you want to, you know, uh, post in the chat, say hi, let us know, you know, where you are, um, and then as we get rolling, feel free to keep the chat comments and, and Q and A going as well. I just want to introduce our main speakers um, right at the, at the beginning. My name is Mandy Whaley, and I lead our DevNet and technical community and our Cisco certifications team. So. Um, Everything around DevNet, where we are connecting with our technical stakeholders, and um, wherever they live in our community of customers, of partners, of developers, of engineers. Um, and then also working with our Cisco certified community, everyone from CCNA through CCIE, from enterprise to data center, um, and including our new DevNet and cyber ops track. Uh, so next I'd like to um, have Par Marat introduce herself. Hi there, thank Hi. you for having me. My name is Parmarat, and I am responsible for the Cisco DevNet ecosystem success. And that is made up of several different programs that we make available to our partners, as well as our uh, developers. Sorry about that. No worries, my dogs are probably gonna do the same thing. Um, so, and then next up, I'd like Eric Field to introduce himself as well. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, so I'm Eric Thiel. I lead technical advocacy within DevNet, and uh, my group does a lot of outreach for things like this, webinars, workshops, trying to get all of the information you all need in the community uh, in a digestible format. So we've got some uh, cool demos to show off during the course of today. We hope you'll enjoy them. Absolutely. All right. Let's get to our next slide. So um, just uh, we covered some of this in the introduction, but um, I think when we're talking about learning and transformation, sometimes it's interesting to know where people came from and, and how they found their way into the work that we're doing. Uh, I actually started my career as a chemical engineer and fell in love with software because I was writing control systems. And um, along that way, you know, became a developer, worked across many different teams, was lucky enough to join Cisco right when DevNet was beginning and started by teaching um, our first Coding 101 for Network Engineers session that we ever had at Cisco Live in San Francisco in the first DevNet zone. And since then, you know, it's been a really fun journey uh, building the DevNet community, working with all of the amazing technologists in our community, and now also with our Cisco certified community. I uh, wanted to just cover some basics around what is DevNet and how do you connect with DevNet? DevNet is Cisco's developer community and set of resources. So everything about building on top of Cisco platforms, whether that's an IoT platform, a data center platform, a network automation platform, a collaboration platform. 
And since the beginning, we've had a really hands-on approach around this mantra of learn, code, connect, and create. All of our resources can be found at developer.cisco.com. And I think you'll see as we work through some of the demos today and some of those resources, how this learn, code, connect, and create path um, is available through the, the digital presence on developer.cisco.com. Uh, just a little bit of history on kind of how DevNet has grown. We like to talk about a, a walk, run, fly journey, and that's something we use as we talk about automation and different ways of building um, skills. But DevNet has also gone through its own walk, run, fly. When we started off in 2014, founded DevNet, and we started bringing together the community of network engineers and developers and looking at this new space of programmable infrastructure. Uh, we've grown to over half a million members strong. That's from all of our amazing customers and partners. And then recently in the last year, we released the DevNet certification, which was an ask from our community around engineers who were spending time learning about containers and automation and Ansible and Terraform and investing in themselves by learning these automation skills. And they wanted the guided tracks of how they fill up and how they certify, similar to the way they build skills for any of our other networking pieces. And then today, we're also building on those certifications with our DevNet partner specializations, which allow partners deeper into that as we continue. So when we started DevNet back in 2014, um, we were looking at how businesses, applications, and infrastructure connect. And we know that DevOps is connecting applications and the programmable infrastructure to allow us to get to new DevOps work, uh, workflows. And what we see now is really this whole um, ability to have APIs across the entire Cisco platform and up and down the stack. And this really is what DevNet is founded on and what all of the innovation that you can build around DevNet rest on top of is this open API-driven architecture um, that's in the Cisco products. With a, in DevNet, we have a lot of resources to help uh, teams, to help engineers start to learn about these platforms and start to build those customer experiences and DevOps flows. We have an area called Start Now. This is because we would get the question, we're ready to dive into automation, but where do we start? So we created something called Start Now. These are free resources that anyone can do. You can pick your track if you're interested in um, data center or you're focused on collaboration or you just really want to get the basics of using source control and Git and Python. Start Now has curated tracks for all of those different areas that people can dive into. And then from there, we have videos and tutorials, even whole video courses, as well as our DevNet Sandbox. Sandbox is one of our most, I think, beloved um, and most used assets within the DevNet community. This is because developers and engineers who are experimenting with automation and trying out new platforms like DNA Center and SD-WAN, they need a place to play and explore and build and build proof of concept. And that's what the Sandbox is about. It's hosted labs, free to the community. Uh, you can go reserve your own you know, SD-WAN Sandbox you can experience the product, you can learn, you can code against the APIs, and there's even simulated traffic, which help you get to real world use cases. And then automation exchange. This is where the community can share. Um, if you're working on a project or looking for some code to help you get a project started, you can go to automation exchange and search for, you know, I'm looking for Python code that helps me use ACI to do this kind of use case. And you might find some code that helps your team get started. And then when you've built something pretty amazing that you want to share with the community, Automation Exchange is also the place where you can share that use case back to the community. And then, um, like we said, in this past year, we've launched the DevNet Learning and Certifications. So a whole track, associate and professional level certifications with expert coming in the future. And then it's all connected through communities. Uh, we firmly believe that the hands-on way to learn backed up by a community of people who are also learning those skills is the real key to transforming teams, to transforming careers. 
And so we have communities and study groups around all these different things. On developer.cisco.com, you will find all of the Cisco platforms. And you'll find them across all of our different architectures, like networking, cloud, data center. And what you will find there is the building block that you need as a company, as a partner, as a developer, to start using these platforms and getting into the automation use cases around them. You'll find the API documentation, you'll find sample code, the developer guides that tell you how to authenticate with a certain product and how to get started, as well as a, being able to get API support. This is an example of a developer center for DNA. These are free open resources for the community, for our customers and partners, that get you into a lot of the new Cisco technology and show you the automation resources associated with it. And then on top of that, um, when you're developing, when you're building solutions and workflows, it's not just the platforms that you're using from Cisco, it's also the surrounding ecosystem of developer tools. And so many of the different uh, webinars, courses, sample code, resources that you'll find actually help you use something like DNA Center or ACI with common DevOps tools like Terraform or the TIGSTAT or Postman or Grafana. So we're always working to bring in those integrations Um, we have, I, I mentioned earlier that there is a, a, a big emphasis in DevNet on getting hands-on with the code and being able to try and experience and build things. And I wanted to walk through a couple examples, and then we have a whole demo section a little bit later in the hour. Um, but I wanted to dive into a couple of these to give a flavor of, of what's available. This is a use case that is available in uh, DevNet Code Exchange which is like Automation Exchange, but a little bit broader in terms of the use cases that are shared there. This one is around monitoring VPN health. And this particular use case got a lot of interest when uh, COVID started to happen. And suddenly VPN was top of everyone's mind in terms of how is their VPN performing? Are they running into any bottlenecks or problems? And this is a, our see it, learn, code it progression where you can see a demo uh, you can go to the sandbox and actually try it out. And we give you code, step-by-step -step, um, instructions on using the code in the sandbox, and all of that is available through Code Exchange. So here's a quick view of um, you know, what, this, what this particular piece of code would do. Um, you can download this. You can set it up. You're building a Grafana dashboard that's going to let you monitor uh, your VPN to look for problems or issues or things like that. So, um, and this is available on developer.cisco.com. You can take it and modify it and use it within your own systems, your own workflows to accomplish a similar type of use case and build a great dashboard to do some things like this. Now I am in Go. Oh, and this is Code Exchange that I mentioned. Code Exchange and Automation Exchange are connected. Automation is a little bit more targeted on network automation use cases, but this is a real resource. Um, Everything is on GitHub. It has uh, licenses where you can use it with open source terms. And um, it's a great place to go and find it. We always say that a lot of the best developers, it's not about how many lines of code you actually write. It's about finding the right code to start from and building your, your cases from there. So from here, I'm going to turn it over to Eric. And he's going to talk us through another use case, one that's really popular in um, Automation Exchange as well. Eric. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks. So I really love the walk use cases because any of you that haven't automated before or are a little bit unsure about what you're doing, it's a great way to get started in a in a very frictionless way and a low risk, low impact way. So this is one that when I meet with customers, I hear from almost every customer is something that they want to be able to do, which is streamline their uh, their auditing of configs to make sure that their devices are all compliant with whatever standards they've defined. And this is an example of a full workflow. I'm going to just demonstrate a small part of that, but you could use something like Ansible to go back up all of your configs to GitHub, check all of your devices across all of your environment uh, to see if they're compliant with your standards. If not, if you're tentative about automation, you could just have it open and pick it in service now and say, these devices need remediation. Here's the config to put in and still let a human do that. 
or you could let Ansible do it for you. And then at the end, back up another copy of the config and show that I've now implemented the recommended changes uh, and it's ready to go. So I will grab the ball and then uh, I will show an example of, of this. And this is something that is published out on Automation Exchange. Uh, so let me see if this works. I'm going to give you the ball. Oh, did you get it? All right. Uh, yep, should be coming through. Thank you. So, so this is a view of this exact use case in Automation Exchange. And the thing I really like about it, other than the fact that I built it, so I know it's awesome, uh, is it's designed to just work out of the box. So um, it's very explicitly documented here. You yourself can go right now, book this sandbox that I'm using, and I literally have the copy and paste commands that, you're, that I'm going to be doing here. So you could go try it yourself and then experiment a little bit. So... I've already spun up the sandbox. That does take a few minutes. And I've already done an initial pull down of, the, uh, of some of the repos or some of the uh, Python libraries just because it'll speed it up. But this is an example where it's already going through checking, making sure it's ready to go and, and has all of the dependencies necessary. And I've even documented in here what is necessary to then do the demo. And I'll talk through as it's running in the background in a second here, I'll talk through what exactly I'm accomplishing. So I'm just going to follow the script as it's put in here. I'm going to run this Ansible playbook. And I like Ansible because it's very easy to get started with. Uh, so now we'll let that run in the background, and I'll talk you through what's actually happening. So I know probably every one of you has either on your laptop or maybe if you're really fancy on a network share somewhere, a, a list of configs that you go through on all your devices and make sure that they're always in place, NTP server, logging, all of that common stuff. So what I've done is I've put that into a script that'll be able to do this. I could run this against, you know, a thousand devices just as easily as I could against the two I'm doing right now. And all I've done is I've defined this gold config role. Now, if I wanted to get even more advanced, I could make roles for border routers, for, you know, DMZ switches, for whatever kind of roles I have in my network. But what that's doing is uh, I'll save you some of the details. You can explore it yourself. But basically what I'm doing is I'm saying, this is my role. So if you're an NXOS device, run the NXOS config. If you're an iOS device, run the iOS config, et cetera. And within there, I'll actually jump to the bottom and work upwards. This probably looks a lot like that file that I mentioned. So if I want to do nothing else, I could just put a bunch of config in here, and then this will go out and tell me whether all of my devices have those lines of config or not. Uh, but I can get a little bit more fancy and do things like loop through all my VTYs and make sure I have an exact timeout set. I can loop through a list of NTP servers and make sure they're all set. I can loop through, I can set my domain name and make sure domain lookups disabled so when I typo it won't take too long. I can loop through a list of users and make sure they all exist or don't exist on that device. Uh, and then I can do things like enabling audit uh, logging. And this one is all specific to iOS, but now I can do the exact same thing in NXOS so that whatever config differences or command differences there are, I can actually do the same thing across all my types of devices. And I'm doing the normalization once and then setting a bunch of variables that'll apply across all. And once I run that, what it does is I use this option in the command line called check mode. And this is why this is a walk use case, because I did all of that against just two devices in this case, but I didn't push any config. So maybe I don't trust it yet. It's telling me on this device, 175, here are all the configs that are out of compliance with my standard, and it would put those configs on if I let it. And then same thing for, uh, oops, same thing for, where am I? Uh, my other device is further up. Um, but yeah, so it loops through uh, each of them. Oh, I apologize. I was only doing it on one this time to speed it up. So it goes through and tells me all of the things that it would change if I were to allow it to, to make it in compliant. Now, if I, once I get comfortable with it, it will be as simple as doing that. And now suddenly I can actually go start pushing configs out to one or a thousand devices in my network. But the beauty of this is very quickly, you could go try this out yourself in the sandbox, see what it's like, and figure out if this might help one of your needs inside of your own environment. So with that, I will go ahead and pass back to Mandy and uh, let her keep going. Great. Thanks. That was great, Eric. If you have questions or want more info or, you know, any of the links, uh, we can put those in the Q&A. And if you have questions, definitely post those there as well. Um, yes, all right. I will, I will I'm share get... that. I'll share that link right now, actually, in the chat. Perfect. Okay. I'm getting my sharing going again. Are we, are we back? Can you see the slides? 
We good? Yep. Excellent. Okay. Yep. Yep. Thank you. So, um, so that's kind of our overview of, of DevNet resources. And we want to make sure everybody just knows where they are. These are all community resources um, open and available with a DevNet login, uh, which is free and, and you can sign up. So we're going to talk more about certification as we get deeper into the session. Uh, but you can find everything about the DevNet certifications at um, slash certification on developer.cisco.com. Automation exchange with the use cases, the awesome example that Eric showed, those are all available at slash automation. And then our sandboxes, the free hosted labs, um, those are available at slash sandbox. And then start now. So these are, if, you're, if you or your team or someone you know is thinking, how do I get started with DevNet? How do I engage? These are um, four great places to really start that engagement and start exploring some of the resources, the use cases, the technology that's out there. All right, the next thing that I want to dive into is more around um, job roles, new job roles that we see emerging in the market, and how DevNet and certifications and a lot of the Cisco learning opportunities are helping people go after these new job roles, helping companies skill up teams to fulfill these new job roles. Um, and we're going to dive into to some of those details. Uh, what we've been seeing in the community is that there are business needs um, like speed and agility, a, a need to scale efficiently, need to deliver really new speed at which business is moving forward, uh, needs for greater operational efficiency. And these are driving the technology needs that we see really coming up to the forefront within teams. Uh, things like doing automation at scale, uh, using secure CICD pipelines, being able to provide self-serve network operations, and then being able to work in distributed systems. And these technology needs, coupled with the business needs, are creating these new areas of job roles. Uh, things like a network automation engineer, someone who has the networking capability, also the software skills, to be able to do things like Eric was just showing us, to be able to manage configs and do compliance in an automated way as well as build the self-serve network operation. Uh, roles like a DevSecOps engineer, someone who has the familiarity with DevOps flows and tooling, but also the security skills that allows you to bring those two together. Network automation developer, this is a trend where we're seeing software developers embed into a network team and really focus on building applications on top of the network and also doing, working with the network automation engineers. IoT architects, and also things like cloud automation engineer. And so one of the things that we've been working on is how can we, with Cisco's you know, world-respected certification um, that we have for network engineering, how can we start to help people and companies go after and meet some of these new job role needs that are out there? And this is our um, complete set of certifications. So we have our network engineering ones, the software track, which are the DevNet certifications, and then a new cyber ops track. And these are all designed so they can stack together. You can build professional concentration um, together in different ways to go after these rapidly evolving spaces around the job roles. This is It's a broad exam at the associate level, covers um, software development uh, concepts and tools, things like containers, introduction to automation, but covers them at the associate level, similar to CCNA type level, but 80% focused on software. And then at the professional level, there's a DevNet professional core, which really gets into software best practices, software design best practices, security, application deployment, and packaging type type concepts as well. And then there's the specialist concentration. And these are where people can pick the areas where they are trying to solve business problems, trying to move things forward in their company, and go very in deep on something like data center automation or service provider automation, and stack these skills together to go after some of these new roles. Um, the, one of the things that's in all of those certifications, in the associate professional and a lot of the concentrations, 
is they do cover Cisco platforms like DNA Center and ACI and SD-WAN, but a huge part of it is actually around the industry skills that are needed to really be able to take advantage of automation. So it covers things like API and SDK implementation, Python, um, deployment and different deployment models, including containers and serverless. Everything around net DevOps, uh, which includes, you know, CI CD pipelines for networks, virtualization, application orchestration using Kubernetes, and then some domain specific tooling. So in these certifications, you will find both the Cisco skills that you need and the industry skills that you need to go after these job roles. An example of one is like the network automation developer. This is an example of how you might build that, that skill set. DevNet professional, so that you have those core software skills, coupled with a Cisco specialist that has the enterprise core specialization and the enterprise automation specialization, as well as, you know, adding in uh, DevOps so that you really understand the DevOps tooling. Another example might be a DevSecOps engineer. This might be someone who comes from having their CCP, CCNP security with a very strong security background, but adding things like security automation, DevOps, and maybe even like a WebEx specialty for being able to build monitoring and alerting using chatbots and things like that. Right now, we have a lot of excitement going on around the DevNet class of 2020. And this is the first year that there have ever been DevNet certifications. Through conversations with the community that people were remembering the first year of CCIE, uh, 1993, and how, you know, sort of legendary the people who got their CCIE during that first year are. And even people who got it in the couple years after that because they have those really low CCIE numbers. And people started realizing that 2020, aside from being all the other things that this year has been, is a very special year for the DevNet certifications because people who get their certification this year will be in that first class of people to ever get these certifications. So we have some special programs going on to help people who want to take this challenge. I know we're getting close to the end of the year, we're getting close to the end of December, but there's still time. Um, you can go to developer.cisco.com slash class of 2020, find out about some of the um, benefits of being in the class of 2020. There's also a 25% off of DevNet exams right now to kind of celebrate and give people that extra push to uh, to get through the class of 2020. So if you have questions about that, let us know. Um, we're giving out digital badges for it and people are already posting them and, and showing off. It's, it's great to see the, the enthusiasm around that. All right, um, next up from there, I wanna turn it over to Par to talk about some of the things we're doing with solutions and in the ecosystem and how this relates to some of the developer resources and certifications that we talked through earlier. Mark. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna start similar to how Mandy did with a slide that's a little bit about me. Um, although I would say the slide reads a little bit more like a, a trend or a, a day in history for uh, ecosystem programs. So I started with Cisco working with Unified Communication Software Partners. These were all ISVs and they were all ISVs who were creating applications um, using uh, collaboration APIs. They were all shrink-wrapped and they were all very complementary, meaning we, we would take them through and we would do a quick uh, integration test, the API call, the API call. And what became very clear was that our customers uh, and our, our bars were calling us, asking us, you know, which ones, which ones of these applications and which companies that have built these applications have been vetted and validated by Cisco. And so I was fortunate enough to be on a team that created a program called Solutions Plus, and I'm still a lead on that program. And that's a program where we take these vetted, validated solutions and put them on our price list. Uh, but as Cisco's API portfolio expanded, uh, we really worked as a team, and I was fortunate enough to be one of the founding members of that team as well, and created DevNet, which you're all here learning lots about, and as that's expanding, um, we're, we are growing, as Mandy mentioned, we have over 500,000 members. But as technology has evolved and as developer applications now hold a much more prominent role in business outcomes, 
I find that we're again getting asked by our customers and our partners, you know, who has the skill set, which organizations have the skill set to deliver the kind of automation and programmability that's available through Cisco platforms. And so we've created the DevNet specialization. And I am fortunate enough to lead the team that, that enables and is responsible for both of these programs under the DevNet um, ecosystem success umbrella. Mandy, go ahead and go to the next slide. So it's kind of a, a so what, right? Um, it, customers are all in digital transformation hyper mode. Um, and so what we're, what we're finding is that our customers are really asking, you know, asking us how to uh, automate their infrastructure and, and how can they manage their information and applications across many locations, um, manage it securely, connect multiple platforms, uh, across multiple data banks. And so they're really looking to Cisco and our partners to not only build this automation for them, to deliver the innovation and solve their business problems. And that's really where DevNet specialization comes in. Um, go ahead, next slide. The good news is, is that automation and apps are supporting all sorts of new use cases. And what we're finding is that it's really accelerating the transformation, the innovation, and the growth. Um, our automation and apps are supporting new use cases across connectivity, across collaboration, and driving all sorts of global requirements for more secure, programmable, automated networks. And that, in turn, is not only driving the demand for people with these skills, people with these new job roles, and these new certification, but it's also driving a whole new software practice discipline within our partner organization. And so we really are looking to our DevNet partner specialized um, ecosystem to deliver these new experiences. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Now we have over 500 partners that are participating in DevNet. We have over 1,400 of them with DevNet certifications, but we have many, many more on the path to create that specialization and to really harden that practice. And so we really have created DevNet specialization to create that path to help our partners enhance their software development practice. And this will have a focus on both the automation and the application development to create these new experiences. Um, Mandy, I don't know if you're behind or if you could go to the next slide. I think, I think there might be a delay. So what, I'm on the one showing the partners. Is that where you want to be? Uh, it, or is there a delay? It, it, it is, uh, is uh, but I'm not seeing that slide. But that's okay. Um, I can talk I, to it. Um, so we've, we've created the DevNet specialization to recognize and differentiate the partners, and we're super proud. This is the first group that's in. We um, launched this specialization last summer. Uh, we went into complete lockdown, so some of the some of the um, the ramp up has been uh, related to that. But we also just announced that at Partner Summit that our, our DevNet Advanced level does count towards gold certification. So that as you engage with these partners or identify as one of these partners, you can feel rest assured that they have been vetted through their business process. They have the tools, the process, and everything else needed to feel good about working with them. And we, of course, have, have many, many more coming along the pipeline as well. Um, the, Go ahead and go to the next slide. Great. So these yep, partners, on the bench. wonderful. So these partners also get additional benefits from DevNet, from our experts that are all on this call. Uh, we give them API technical support and pre-sales consulting. So if you're a partner on this call and you want to participate in that, it's great that you are investing in yourself and you are ensuring that you have these new skills, uh, pull your company in. You know, it, tell your, tell your um, folks that you definitely want to make sure that you're able to be recognized and get these sorts of um, opportunities and these sorts of benefits, both pre-sales and post-sales for consulting support. We're also providing API access webinars. So similar to how this group is getting pulled together and seeing some tips and tricks, we are making sure that our DevNet specialized partners 
are pulled together and we're giving them some API insights on a regular basis, which is really great, as well as providing them with a bit more um, co-marketing sort of opportunities. So really that's about DevNet specialization. The last benefit that we give them, go ahead and go to the next slide, which everyone has benefited from, is really being able to deliver DevNet Express events so that they can leverage our DevNet infrastructure and work with all of you, or if you're a partner, work with your customers, bring them in, do some hands-on, get access to the, the content and the material that really walks people through kind of a learn it, see it, code it approach to our, our APIs. And then, you know, kind of circling back, um, go ahead and go to the next slide. And we should be looking at a slide on the Solutions Plus partners. Tell me if we, yep, we are, perfect. Um, we still have Solutions Plus. It is still very much alive and well. These are applications that have deep integrations with our APIs. I'm calling out three in particular because they're very conducive to what's going on in the world right now. The first one is Involvio, and that's a very deep engagement, a student engagement application that allows virtual and hybrid and, and communities within an education system to connect. Um, it also allows for map navigation on site. It also allows to integrate with their student records. So it is highly effective and highly engaging. So I would definitely um, look to that if you, have if you are an education customer or if you have any education customers. The next one is Biopta, and this is really, um, I'm calling out healthcare because it really much does pertain to telehealth right now. It allows us to, it allows you to make sure that you have a very high quality experience on your network for, for video. It integrates with our collaboration and telepresence end, endpoints, and it really does proactively monitor the, your entire unified communications environment resulting in really an improved experience and, and an improved ROI for that healthcare. If any of you have done any telemedicine appointments in the last few months, you'll know that this is super critical. And then lastly, our newest um, uh, entree into Solutions Plus is a company called NS1. And NS1 is really all about NetOps, DevOps, and SecOps teams, allowing them to really proactively um, more efficiently, securely, and reliably deliver scale and network uh, traffic uh, direction. It, it, it has a deep integration with Cisco Umbrella and AnyConnect. So again, thank you. All things, you know, you're, you're all individuals here working on your skill sets. You're looking at ways to help your customers, ways to help your own environment, DevNet uh, specialization, and uh, DevNet Solutions Plus absolutely build upon that. Mandy, go ahead and go to the next slide. And that really is the conclusion of my section. If you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the room. I also, I think, have Chuck Stickney on the call who can answer some questions, especially if you are a partner interested in becoming DevNet specialized. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Par. That was, that was great. Um, once again, please please put your questions in there. We'll be sure to connect and, and follow up. Um, and it's, uh, there's so much information densely in those slides that I'm sure people may want to go go deeper on on some of those pieces. Uh, the next part that we want to look at is this idea that we've been talking around uh, about innovation at scale. And we have a DevNet virtual event. It was our first uh, DevNet Create virtual um, at the beginning of October. It's usually a small event we have in person in Mountain View, and uh, it's usually about 700 people. This year we had it digitally, and we had it in three time zones, and it was um, 33,000. Uh, yeah, 33,000 people. Um, you may hear some noise. I think my son's playing his guitar downstairs. Um, so, um, but we've been talking about innovation at scale because people are looking at how do they transform whole teams? How do they transform whole, uh, you know, teams within teams connecting with bigger teams within their company? And we have a couple of themes that we have found within the community and we're working on building ways to help companies innovate at scale and to transform their teams. So we're going to talk through just a few of those. Uh, one of the things we've heard is that people are finding the ability to innovate at scale with DevNet. They are finding people who are jumping into automation 
starting small projects, it starts kind of a spark. That's why we have the ripple effect and then really begins to, to change the company. And some of those DevNet specialized partners that Par talked about, they are some people who had these groups of engineers who dove in, did the learning, built some skills, and really transformed the team around them. And it's happening at um, all kinds of companies, uh, companies that are, you know, have strong technology teams, but they're a retail company or working in other areas. And it's also happening in our partners. One of the things that can spark this innovation at scale are some of the new tools. And so one thing you will always find on DevNet is a place where you can go, you can find all these new tools that people can dive into. Uh, Postman collections, this is something we're working really hard on. Postman is a tool that makes it fast and easy to explore APIs. So we want um, engineers and developers to be able to find Postman collections for Cisco Platform so they can get started instantly. We've talked about code exchange. Um, that's a great resource. Cisco Modeling Labs is a network simulation tool. If you're wanting to do automation, you need a way to test the scripts, to test the automation, to see how it affects your environment. And Cisco Modeling Labs is a really great simulation tool where you can build your topology and practice running your, your, um, your scripts and workflows against it. And then everything through sandboxes all the way to interactive API docs. And then the other thing that we have heard from people who are looking at this innovate at scale idea is really this full journey of diving into areas like SD-WAN. This is a very important area. Companies are really trying to build up teams around it, figure full journey of resources that get you connected with the product, like Sandbox. Um, the developer resources where you can go get engineer to engineer kinds of tutorials, deep dive training courses on, you know, implementing SD-WAN as well as automating SD-WAN, and then the ability to test your skills through all the different certifications and connecting with all of the developer ecosystem tools as well. And the three areas that we've really been working with the community and hearing a lot of interest from multiple teams in the community have been around SD-WAN. Another is security. Uh, security has a lot of new different technology, new opportunities around Umbrella and SecureX. And, um, but it takes resources and time and training for teams to be able to adopt these. So we're working really hard um, to across all these modes, including the courses, the training, and developer resources to make sure that teams have access to find out the latest, what they can do with Umbrella to understand how to bring Duo into their organization. And then the last one is really around data center automation. And within data center automation, infrastructure as code is a very big topic that a lot of organizations are diving into and figuring out how it serves their needs, how they want to use it in their operations. And so there's a big push around all of our data center products um, to integrate with things like Terraform and Ansible to start educating teams on how to do infrastructure as code. And that is something you'll find throughout the training, throughout the certifications, um, and through a lot of the free resources as well. Uh, now we're to the exciting demo part of the, the section, and you'll get to see a lot of the, the skills and resources that we talked about are the building blocks for building these kinds of workflows that we're going to see in the demos. So I'm going to turn it over to Eric. He's going to do a quick intro, uh, set the stage for the demos, and then we'll be going um, through three really great presenters who will share the demos with us. Eric. Awesome. Thanks, Mandy. Okay. Yeah, so uh, so we've got three teed up for you, three more. Um, the first ones, these are all examples of things that you might go and find on Code Exchange Automation Exchange or things like them. So first up, Kareem is going to talk to us about how you could do secure automation with DNA Center using some credential vaulting. Uh, the next one is going to be Veer talking about automating uh, firewall deployment, uh, firewall health statistics collection. And then uh, last up, Richard's going to show a little bit of ACI automation. So with that, we can uh, we can go ahead and pass the ball to Kareem and uh, see what Kareem's got in store for us with DNA Center and, uh, and HashiCorp Vault. Yeah, 
double mute, I believe, Kareem. We're not getting you still. Get on mute. Uh, do star six. We're on mute in the app. Okay. Can you guys hear me now? Yep, we got you now. Sorry about that. I was on double mute. So uh, one of the things that we, uh, we tend to talk about a lot is, you know, as you're automating your network, as you're building out that automation script is, how do you actually save your credentials and how do you manage that? And um, what I wanted to do is I wanted to put together an, an example of um, of HashiCorp Vault and how we can integrate that into our instance of DNA Center. And it doesn't really have to be DNA Center. Um, it could be any Cisco product, any product that um, manages that you, you, would, you would need to, to utilize in order to automate your network. And so um, with Vault, um, just want to give you a quick introduction on what Vault is and why we're doing this and how cool it is to integrate with your um, automation within your automation journey. So in general, what is Vault? Vault is a tool for, for securely accessing your secrets. Uh, and you're going to ask me, what is a secret? A secret could be anything, right? It could be a DB cred, username, password, API token, a TLS cert. It doesn't really matter. In the case of DNA Center, we're saving the entire instance of username and password of DNAC um, because that's the way we authenticate against DNAC by supplying the username and password and bringing back a, uh, a token that will event, eventually utilize for the subsequent API calls to, to you know, manage our network, automate our devices, whatever it is that we're after. Um, so what is the problem that we're actually solving for? And the problem we're, ask, we're solving for is our secret sprawl. And basically, as you're looking and building out your scripts, you're going to see that a lot of the times you're going to be hard coding some of the your API token, your username and password within your Python code itself. And that's, in, that's pretty bad practice. Uh, the other thing is Eric showed us uh, an automation script with Ansible. Uh, you can actually leverage, the problem is when you have your, your Ansible script up and running, you can actually essentially hard code your, configura your, your uh, secrets within the configuration management itself. And in turn, it ends up on GitHub if you or, you know, working with Git uh, across your organization. And so what we wanted to find a way is we wanted to find a way to solve for access control, be able to have an audit trail, find out which application is essentially accessing these secrets and when. And if anything happens, we want to be able to shut down that application access as opposed to going to the device itself and changing the username and password or, or renewing the authentication token for an API call. Um, and being able to do a periodic ro rotation without without changing the our code without without affecting our application itself. So with Vault, you get encryption end to end, overlay ACL. Um, so you can you, know, you can say application one has access to these secrets as opposed to application two has access to these you know that secret, and um, you can kind of isolate that. Um, and then you like I said, we can audit trail. All right, so enough slides, let's talk about a demo. What we have here is um, a submission to our automation exchange and um, our, our code exchange. What I went through is I, sh I walk you through how we essentially get started with Vault. I already have my instance of Vault up and running, so I won't go through the initialization of that. But if, you, if this is something that's interested, that you're interested in, in adopting in your, um, through your automation journey, you can head over to this submission and follow the step-by-step -step instructions. Um, I, I give you um, a vault configuration file that you can start with, as well as a Postman collection that would allow you to do your first step initialization of your vault and um, get you started with that. So what I've done is I've in, instantiated, an, an instantiated an instance of vault on my local machine, and I've already hard-coded, not hard-coded, I've already submitted some of uh, secrets into my, my vault. And what uh, my instance of vault, what I'm doing is I'm going out to my Python. I can show you this how this works. And I'm using two things. 
I'm using the, let me zoom in hopefully so you guys can see this. Uh, here we go, not zooming in on this side. Anyway, um, what I'm using is I'm using the HVAC, which is the Vault SDK as well as the DNA Center SDK, and I'm going out and I'm accessing the secret into my vault. I'm unsealing my, my key, my, uh, my instance of vault, and I'm going out and I'm saying, this is my application. I have an API access to my instance of vault. I wanna go through that and essentially pull the information from vault so I can start authenticating against DNAC. And the way you authenticate against DNAC, you supply the username password as well as the instance of DNAC itself. Um, and, and then I'm, all I'm doing is simply using the DNA Center SDK to go out and get a list of devices. And you can see, you can build on top of that as much as you want. So if I go out and say, um, run this vault.py, it's gonna go out, hit my instance of vault. It's gonna come back and say, okay, I've gotten your username and password. Now I can go in and nothing was passed here, right? There was no, no username and password, no uh, DNAC username and password that was authentic, was leveraged or was basically sh uh, showing up in that script. And I'm able to go out and access my instance of DNAC pull a list of devices in, and you can start building on top of that. So it's really powerful to be able to essentially leverage Vault for throughout your automation in general. Um, everything that I discussed here, and I know I had a short period, there's more details that I'd love to go through with you. Uh, but if you're interested in this project, go out to our code exchange and check it out. Um, I have all the instruction for you to get started. And uh, with that, I'd like to bring in Veer, who's gonna show us something cool um, with security. Veer, I think you're also double muted. Hi everyone, thank you. I'm Christian Veer. Um, I focus on security. And so the use case which I have here is very simple use case. Um, um, let me show you guys. The problem which we face today is that um, a lot of deployments are happening both in kind of like a hybrid environment, especially with IPS, uh, because we would like to monitor traffic in our virtual environment as well and in, in, in cloud deployment, especially the VPCs to monitor traffic. And after a while, we have, in, we have put these multiple virtual machines, we kind of lost the, even the count. Like, And for operation teams, it's a nightmare to figure out which one of those are up, what state they are in, and, and if they have to take certain actions, what actions should be they taking it. So the first problem which they, they encounter is figuring out what is the status of those machines and what health condition they are in, those virtual machines which are running the IPS solution, or, or NGFW, if they have deployed NGFW. So I wrote a very simple script, and what it does, it goes to um, FNC and, and figure out the status of devices, and then it creates a JSON file and stores. Um, this can be taken further. You can use that JSON file to integrate with uh, your Splunk dashboard, and you can have nice buttons showing the status of your machines or other way you want a dashboard, you can dashboard. So it's a simple um, code. If you look at it, I just uh, create token, which is required to be created. I mean, if you want to use um, FMC REST API, you have to first get token. And that you have to do it use programmatically. Um, so you, there is no token which you can issue yourself using UI. So you have to send a request to get the token and then you have to use token and it has a short time to live. And all I do is that once I get that token, I actually um, go through multiple functions. So in my case, I have like, I think four functions. And those functions actually do a, 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 a basically a read operation and I collect that information and store it in a file. Um, like um, uh, Karim mentioned that Vault is a great way to manage your, to, um, manage your uh, passwords. So in my 
um, using environment variables, which is a little safer than coding into the uh, into the actual Python file. But Vault will be a great solution for me. It's just like I have a, a FMC which is running on six zero zero two port, and all I do is that FMC. And you can have these multiple FMC as well. It depends what your use case is. And all I do is. Um, execute a command and I will get the full information of all the devices associated and what condition they are in, right? So, which is very helpful because this is a great way to figure out very quickly what is the condition and posture of my deployment, IPS deployment. So, if you look at it, um, it um, creates a file here based on my host name because I said we can have multiple FMCs here. And you have device records, you have health records, what versions they are running, you can get all information. So if you look at the health alerts, what I mean to say is that here, the status is green, the license is valid, uh, status is disabled. All this information is very valuable, especially when you are part of the operation team so that you have holistic view of your um, IPS solution. So this can be now embedded into, uh, or you can, you can actually consume this in Splunk dashboard or any other dashboard a solution which you are which you are using. So that's what the quick demo, Eric, and I'll pass the ball to um, Richard. Uh, Richard. Yep, Richard is up next. He's going to take us through a little bit of ACI automation demo. Uh, so while he's grabbing the ball, um, again, appreciate both uh, Veer and Kareem. Uh, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, go check out Automation Exchange and Code Exchange. And uh, Richard, assuming you are not double muted, you can take it away. Yeah, thank you. Just waiting for the ball there. Yeah, it's done on my side, Richard. All right, so thank you. you. Okay, Let's see if this comes through. Let me uh, go from there. All right, thank you very much. So um, let me just uh, fire up this uh, presentation. So I've asked today to do a, uh, a bit of a demonstration on ACI. Uh, Certainly. Am I showing the presenter view there by any chance? Just confirming. You are. It's the presenter view. Yep. All right. Let me just switch that. <laughs> I thought it was. There we go. All right. Uh, a very quick demonstration on how we can use Terraform to automate ACI. Um, now, uh, we haven't talked about Terraform a great deal today, but it's one of the sort of up and coming modern uh, infrastructure as code orchestration platforms. And it's more aimed at API services rather than CLI services. And it, it's not so much a uh, a scripting function um, that perhaps Ansible is. Ansible is very good at doing sort of scripts and iterating over various uh, various objects. Uh, Terraform was very much about instantiating an object to a set standard and then uh, being able to provide uh, kind of dependencies between those objects. So we'll, we'll show that as we go. Um, the key thing with Ansible, a difference perhaps between Ansible and Terraform is that Terraform keeps track of state. It knows what the environment was like when it last executed its uh, its configuration set. Um, if you want to add something to that configuration, you add it to your configuration file um, and it will create a new resource. If you want to change something, you can change a variable in that resource definition and it will compare it against the current state and say, oh, I need to change this particular field. And uh, we remove things by literally removing it out of the configuration file and it says, oh, well, in the current state, there is this object. It's no longer there in the configuration file. Um, I want to delete it. That's obviously the intent, so I'll remove that object. Um, yeah, and uh, that state file is something important because it needs to be shared amongst the m multiple users. If you've got multiple users trying to make configuration changes, you want to be constantly referencing a, a, a common state file. And you can uh, use that as a local file and share it through something like GitHub, uh, like I'm doing here. Um, or you can use Terraform's own, own services themselves. They have a cloud or enterprise-based service to host those, those state files. So let me just uh, jump through this. So I had a, my demo today, I'm trying to do it very quickly, in it, but it is quite wide in scope. So we'll see how far we get. Um, there's really three parts to it. I'm trying to configure the network and security for a new application, uh, then to clone a new virtual machine and install an application on that virtual machine through Docker. Now I've kept all three of these as separate configuration files for this demo. Um, but in the real world, you might combine them all together into one single uh, Terraform configuration that literally does the whole end-to-end -end solution. And that's really one of the powers of Terraform is that it, it can talk to multiple, uh, multiple providers, multiple um, services at once, and uh, share information between them and keep a common state file of everything that's going on. All right. So this is very quickly my ACI lab environment. Um, I have a... Oh, sorry, I seem to have dropped out of share there. 
Try that again. Here we go. Um, I have a uh, ACI lab, um, ACI fabric for my lab. It's a couple of spines, uh, some border leaves that connect out to my, my network, and another pair of leaves that connect out to my computer environment. And that's a, a UCSB series platform for those who are interested in it. Um, within ACI, we have a concept of tenants, which are like a, a logical entity that can, can uh, controls access rights and policies. Um, and within ACI, we have this concept of a common tenant that can share configuration between other tenants. And I'm, within that tenant, I have a VRF for my lab environment. And that lab uh, has a, effectively a routed interface out to my, the rest of the network. And uh, we use OSPF to, to advertise networks uh, to and from there. Um, what I want to show today is really this next part, which is that we're going to use Terraform to add a completely new tenant, uh, a new VRF. Um, within that totally separate route table. And within that, we start using some ACI constructs uh, like a bridge domain, which is effectively like a layer two network, uh, and an endpoint group. Now, endpoint group is a, effectively a, a group of servers that provide a common function. Uh, in this case, it's a web service function, but um, I've called this uh, app one as the uh, EPG. And that uh, EPG itself here has an IP address network associated to it. So it's effectively a subnet for those web servers. Now that uh, when I instantiate this uh, this uh, EPG, uh, due to the way I have my ACI network configured, it's automatically going to extend. Uh, oh, it's going to allocate a VLAN uh, for a start out of, out of a pool of resources in ACI, and trunk that towards my UCS um, service. Uh, in the UCS platform, it's going to trunk that VLAN down towards my VMware environment, and it's going to dynamically create a new port group in VMware as well. Uh, and again, you can see the naming convention there is sort of tenant, application profile, app, EPG name. And that's all going to be automated through through Terraform here today using you know, effectively a common or, or native functions within ACI. Um, ACI doesn't just stop at the networking. The other key part is the security function. Uh, and the security function within uh, ACI is basically start to the zero trust model, that nothing is allowed to talk between uh, endpoint groups, uh, unless you have a contract, effectively an ACL saying you're permitted to talk on these ports of protocols. So what we're doing as well as part of this is to set up an external EPG. Effectively, it's a, a group of people we want to talk to outside of the network. Um, and then set up some filters, uh, so contracts and filters to say that uh, that group of people, or in this case, anybody, <laughs> um, yeah, anybody outside the network, um, uh, will can talk into my web servers on these particular ports and protocols. And also in the other direction, I want to say that my web servers can talk out to the internet on certain ports and protocols, in this case like you know, UDP 53 for DNS and uh, common web ports. Now, ACI also does uh, uses these contracts to enforce route leaking. So even though I've got a completely separate VRF, separate tenant, separate everything, uh, but just by the act of configuring these, these uh, contracts, um, I'm going to uh, learn the default route from my common route table, my, my uh, lab VRF, and I'm going to uh, inject into that this EPG network as well. So all the routing is going to be taken care of for me uh, as well. So let me uh, jump to my other screen here, and I'll show you the, uh, quickly the configuration uh, for that. There we go. So uh, I use, uh, this is a, a Terraform uh, configuration file. Um, it effectively defines within uh, relatively easy to inspect and easy to understand language uh, how we want to configure resources within that particular provider. This provider is uh, ACI. Um, I'm, I'm currently using sort of statically hard-coded usernames and passwords, um, but the, uh, we'd obviously use HashiCorp Vault if we can as well. So Terraform is also part of HashiCorp. It's a, you know, a, a similar product um, to, to do that in the real world. And we're using um, this to define these resources, effectively setting up the tenant, setting up the VRF, setting up the bridge domain, all of that, all the way down to the individual filters, the, the ports and protocols we're going to allow. And um, we're going to uh, then deploy that. So let me just uh, make sure I'm signed in here just to show that underway. And I'll execute that, uh, execute that file. Let's go to my tenants list here. So this is my existing tenants in here. The common tenant is, I said, a default one that's part of uh, ACI. And uh, we're now going to run the uh, Terraform apply command. And it's going to go through that uh, Terraform configuration and work out what it needs to add by, uh, by questioning the, uh, the environment. So it will go off and, sorry, I need to clarify here. It will connect to the, um, 
uh, connect to the environment and uh, see what resources are, are present, you know, what the current environment looks like, or what it, compare that to the file and uh, work out what needs to be changed. And uh, so now when we've, we've run that file, we're going to go and generate all these configurations. Now, one thing that Terraform does really well is dependency mapping, so that uh, it doesn't matter where I put my resources in my file. If one resource depends on another, it's already programmed in and will execute in the right order to generate the configuration. So here we've generated all the tenants, the, uh, the, fault, the, the contracts, the VRFs, everything has been generated, and um, uh, we can see that now that we have this new tenant uh, in the AC, in ACI environment, and uh, we can drill down into there and have a look at the... Um, uh, the configuration, particularly around the, uh, the networking of the application group and the EPG. And under that, we can see the, uh, the IP address for the network in there as well. So the, um, the next part I wanted to do, and uh, just checking my timing, I think we've got uh, time to keep going. Um, I'm just going to trigger this off first, and then I'm going to uh, actually tell you what I'm doing, because <laughs> this one takes a couple of minutes to deploy. Um, let me go uh, run that. Uh, oh, sorry, one, I have one thing to change, so my apologies. But I found um, this is a, a thing as we were going through the environment. Um, uh, testing this yesterday, I actually had to raise a bug against my Terraform provider from ACI to uh, correct one, uh, one part, of the, uh, uh, part of the system where the uh, Terraform doesn't check a tick box when it needs to do so. So I have uh, have raised that in the last day. <laughs> so bear with me one second while I just uh, tick that and I'll... Uh, I'll trigger off this other command. And uh, so nothing like uh, finding a bug a day out from the presentation, but um, it's, uh, this is something that should have been automated and wasn't, um, just to, to set the scene there. So uh, I'm now just going to run my, my second part, which is a, the cloning of the VMware. And I'm just going to, to uh, again, show you what that's doing and uh, show you a little bit about the uh, configuration. So I'm just signing into my uh, VMware environment here, and I've just triggered off this Terraform uh, command, and I, I, can, I can share this. But effectively, it's going to clone a VM in the background, and it's going to associate itself to that uh, this port group here that we created as part of the, uh, the ACI platform. So all of that's going to clone, uh, customize, set an IP address, and uh, configure from there. So just wait for that to finish. Uh, thanks. Fortunately, these things are relatively quick to do, um, and you can you can track that on the confider here that keeps track of how long it's going. And this does take a couple of a couple of minutes to go and do that. So what I wanted to show here was uh, very quickly the next couple of steps. So to see if we can make sure we have this squeezed in in time. So what we're doing here is running a, a separate uh, Terraform file that uses a different provider. The provider is in this case a vCenter or v vSphere as the provider. And we're going to, we've uh, got the configuration to point a template, customize that with an IP address, and to set it to the port group that we've just created. So we're going to yeah, effectively create a server to use the networking security policies we've just uh, instantiated. The next step, and if, uh, again, I'll, I'll run that very quickly afterwards, is to use Docker as a provider. Now, I've got this template I'm cloning, this VM uh, has Docker installed on it, and it's been customized in a slight way to expose Docker as a, as a service. So um, what we're doing there is to uh, use Terraform to connect to Docker on that VM when it's running and to uh, download and install two containers, effectively a default Apache container and an Nginx container, effectively a, a demo environment for that one. Now, in the real world, we wouldn't be using Docker like this. We'd probably be using some sort of orchestration engine above that, like Kubernetes, uh, and using a, talking to the Kubernetes provider or maybe the Helm provider for Kubernetes to instantiate applications. But um, again, only so much you can do in a, in a demo. But, um, so let me just uh, confirm. Yes, that's, uh, that's been created. So we now have a working uh, virtual machine uh, in there. Uh, let me just go back to my uh, demo in here. We can see this virtual machine over here. And we can see it's uh, even picked up the right IP address. So it's customized the IP address, uh, and that's uh, ready to go. Um, back to here. Um, and yes, we can ping that IP address. That's the IP address. I'm pinging it live now. So that VM didn't exist before. So the very last step I want to do is to um, connect to uh, connect to that server and to deploy using uh, my Docker provider uh, a couple of applications onto it. And we're going to do that very, very quickly now. Uh, it doesn't take as long as the last step. And it's going to go off. Um, again, I'll, I'll share the configuration for the, um, 
the, 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 the code here. But it's effectively being told to go and download an image from public registry and instantiate a container and to expose that container on a particular port. And there we go. So that's got two containers running on port 80 and port uh, 8080. And uh, if I, the final step here, um, sorry, if I just uh, move this out of the way a little bit, that I should be able to browse to port 80 on that server, on that IP, and uh, that's the effectively the default Apache page. Uh, very, very boring, which is why I also put on the uh, Nginx one. Now this is a, uh, a little bit more dynamic, and it shows you more how the uh, Nginx the container is working. So there we go, in that time frame, it's a very short time frame, I think I've got to about 11 minutes now, um, <laughs> or thereabouts. Um, we've got the, uh, the network built from a, a ten, uh, from a tenant to a VRF to a the bridge domains, all of the security, the ACLs effectively within the, the Zero Trust ACI security environment built. We've cloned a VM, we've even installed some applications and actually tested that end to end that we can get through. Um, so that's, um, yeah, again, the power of Terraform there is that you can build it once, maintain that state um, and then uh, make changes as, the wish, as you wish to do so. So I can go back to Terraform now and I can say, like, I want to expose a different port or change a different port um, and we can do some very quick changes there and instantiate that. But uh, if you have uh, any more of um, any questions on, on that, I'm more than happy to, to, to take those offline. All right. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I think the, the only thing I was going to perhaps add just in the last 30 seconds that I had was um, you know, things we could do to improve this uh, that you would take up in your own environments. I, I'm using GitHub here, obviously, and that's you know, perfectly fine. I've got an internal GitHub, so I don't mind synchronizing sort of applications and credentials so much into that. But um, what you could do is if you wanted to keep using GitHub is to do a, uh, a CICD pipeline where you can you know, effectively branch the Terraform commands, um, uh, configuration files, make your changes to that, and then uh, submit it back into the GitHub repository to be merged into the main branch. And you can configure things like Jenkins to look out for those merges and actually then run a script. So that merge could actually implement the whole Terraform uh, apply command as part of that. And that's a proper CI CD pipeline. Um, but again, the biggest one is probably Kubernetes. That's really where people are heading in terms of data center or orchestration. Um, and uh, along those lines, um, Cisco has some very interesting things coming along in terms of ter uh, Intersight uh, Terraform service and our Intersight Kubernetes service uh, to help you do this across on-prem servers and cloud. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, um, Richard. That was fantastic. And Terraform is definitely something that we are seeing uh, Cisco have providers for across many of the products. On DevNet, you can find them for Intersight. We just saw the ACI one. There's also ones for titration. Um, so if you go to developer.cisco.com, check out those product sites or the um, Nexus API site, which is the data center infrastructure as code site. There's a lot of information on Terraform, how to get started, Terraform providers, all those pieces. But that was an awesome demo. Uh, really, really nicely done. All right, so we are gonna con continue on uh, finishing up this theme around innovation at scale and how it really starts with it can start with one person, one engineer, who takes the step to do something like those amazing use cases that we just saw, and then how that starts to transform an organization. Uh, we do have some things that we are doing. Am I sharing? Yes? No? You're not. No. You're not. Uh, thank you. I knew I was going to forget to do that. All right. Now I think I'm sharing. Yes? Sharing? Can yep. you see it? Yep. yep. Yes, Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so so uh, when a company is trying to transform, we're trying to make sure that there are many different modes of learning, of resources that can help along that way to creating innovation at scale. And one of the ways that we're doing that is through a new workforce transformation package. And you can get information at this at cs.co slash skill up. And this is uh, bringing together some of the things that we've talked about throughout the night tonight. Um, we have a DevNet Associate Certification Study Group, which connects a community of people together, has an eight-week study plan, takes people through um, automation, get a lot of the technologies that we just saw in those demos are introduced and covered within that eight-week study plan. And then the next phase from that is a DevNet Automation Boot Camp. This is a new immersive um, learning experience that we have 
that takes a team of people from deep dive instructor-led training on some of those topics like uh, using Git and GitHub, using CICD, using things like Terraform and Ansible, building Python skills, and then also gives them a set of e-learning courses, all of the DevNet resources, they can go off and do self-study, then come back for another week in person, virtual of course, where we do hands-on exercises, coding together, um, walking through building some use cases around a specific technology like ACI or NSO or NXOS. And so this boot camp is to really get from that learning the foundations, doing some self-study, doing an immersive hands-on week together, and also some um, office hours and mentoring along the way to help the team move forward. And then the other part of it is, of course, our um, subscription to our Cisco Digital Learning Library, which has all the DevNet courses in it, all the SD-WAN courses in it. You know, it's really a place where people can go find the courses, learn at their own pace. So this is all together in a package. And um, like I said, you can get more information at this URL. Uh, I just talked about those learning subscriptions. Those are uh, really key, and there's a lot of different ways to access them, whether it's self-serve, um, whether you are bringing those courses in and doing some instructor-led through virtual. Um, and there's different groupings of courses around topics like DevNet or SD-WAN or Data Center that you can access and, and dive into. And um, Eric, I was going to let you talk a little bit about Automation Bootcamp. Uh, your team's been working really hard on um, delivering these and working with our community and customers around these deep dive training sessions. Uh, so do you want to add a little bit of more detail around the automation? Absolutely. Yeah, this one's near and dear to my heart because my team's really been involved in, in helping form these and, and get them launched. Uh, and the thing that we heard from a lot of people is organizations that want to take on programmability and automation, they know they want to build this skill set out within their team, um, but it is a lot of friction to get over that first hurdle. Um, so the I, we really see that this is an opportunity to get that immersive experience where, you know, it's a week worth of training where you're going to get lots of hands-on time, but it's focused on building the skills. And then that week two really lets people kind of explore and experiment a little bit in the lab and get really immersed in the technology of it. Uh, and then the, again, those coaching hours at the tail end where you can actually come back and, and have questions on things that maybe you covered in the two weeks or uh, if you're hung up trying to, uh, trying to get through one of the uh, lessons after the fact. Um, and it's, again, it's all bounded in lots of hands-on time, lots of time to explore and experiment, and uh, hopefully coming out of it, your organization would, would be ready to now start taking some of these tasks on yourself. Um, no, you can, go, you can go ahead and flip. And then the yeah. other one Mandy also alluded to uh, is the study groups. And this is, you know, that well, whereas boot camps are a little bit more organizational focused, we'll come out and do it for your organization. This is great for anyone that wants to uh, be an individual learner. So if you are just getting started, the CCNA guided study group is a great opportunity to pair yourself up with, uh, you know, join a study group that's being led by an expert in the field and take you through. I know, you know, when I've certified, I've gone through periods where it's really hard to get that inertia up and, and actually get myself to go to do my lessons for the week. And this really helps give you that nudge to see a bunch of other of your peers all going through it at the same pace, asking questions, helping each other through it, and then having that expert guiding you through. And the same with the associate. If you're already comfortable with the networking side, the DevNet Associate one is a great way to get started on programmability and get introduced to these and, and nudged along and helped along through the flow uh, with the idea being you can come out the far side, you, you've got the vouchers, so you can actually go and uh, practice, go through the course a few times, and then uh, go and actually take the exam and get certified. Uh, and we do have both of those scheduled out, so uh, if you're interested, you can definitely reach out and get more details on when the next of each of those are coming up. Um, and then, uh, if you're not, if you look, if you're much more self-paced driven, then we also have the fundamentals course. So that guided study group is is back ended by this amongst, uh, along with those live sessions. So if you just want a resource that you can go through at your own pace, this is a great resource to use for that. Um, it showcases one of our newer platforms where it's a very integrated learning experience all within the browser. You get to do coding, you get an editor, you can kind of see the preview of that. So it's a really good experience and easy to just pop in when you have a little bit of time during the day or a little bit each evening, you can pop in, go through another lesson and whatever pace you want to work on, you can start building those skills. 
And I can take this one. Um, one other thing we wanted to let everyone know is that, you know, if you're wanting to take a certification exam, uh, we know that there are a lot of places in the world where testing centers are closed, but we made the decision earlier this year to um, to offer all of our, our certification exams through online proctored testing through Pearson View. So um, you can take the test from the comfort of your own home. There are some um, some tests that you need to do on the environment, on your network connection before jumping into the test. But we're hoping that this really helps people, you know, set their goals and not have any barriers in their way and getting to them and taking those exams. So we're very excited uh, to see people being able to take advantage of that. And then, um, Eric, do you want to give a little bit of preview for Cisco Live Europe, which is coming up? Absolutely. And, and even though I know that this is uh, a, a targeted audience uh, more in the Australia New Zealand space, uh, the great thing with digital events is you don't have to be there uh, in any given geo. So especially if you're looking to do this on your own time, this will actually be a little bit later in your day, I believe, So um, or earlier. No, that'll be later in your day. So uh, we've got we've got a great agenda coming up. Uh, there's day one is going to have a whole track full of keynotes. Susie's going to be out there talking about a lot of her vision, uh, and then the rest of it day two and three, and as well as the next week, there are a lot of hands-on opportunities and stuff. Those are part of the paid program this year. Uh, so uh, day one is going to be all free, and and the rest, the capture the flag. We've got uh, we'll, we'll be doing some sort of a demo jam in there. Uh, lots of great content uh, for you guys to go and consume. And the great thing is now because uh, because we've gotten used to the digital events, we're also able to offer continuing education credits uh, as part of the day two, day three, and the uh, week two events. So if you're looking to recertify any of your exams from associate all the way through uh, expert, you can actually earn some of your CE credits through this event uh, to count towards that. Yep. And um, Par, I don't know if you're on, but um, I don't know if you want to mention how Cisco Learning Credits fit into all of these different opportunities that we just talked through. I know these are something that many people really value and, and take, um, you know, really use as part of their learning strategy. Par, are you muted? Okay. I can cover it really quick. Double, double, oh, double, muted, double muted, yep. double trouble here. Hey, I, I'm staying off video so that you can hear me loud and clear because I'm so glad you brought up uh, learning credits. They absolutely are a sure proof way to um, get access to um, the, all of this wonderful, rich learning. So you can work with your account manager. Um, if you're an account manager, uh, talk to your customers about this. Um, these are absolutely wonderful ways to put inside of a, um, an, a, a deal um, access directly. Uh, if you have any questions on how to get access to these, please feel free to leave your name in the chat and we will follow up with you directly. Okay, great. Thank you, Par. Um, and that is, um, we're ready for questions. I don't know, I think we've caught most of them in um, the chat as we've been going along. And thank you for all the amazing questions people have been bringing in. Um, I just wanna say thanks to everyone. Thanks to all the presenters. Thanks to the uh, people doing the demos. Live demos are the best and the most fun, but it takes some bravery to do them. And I wanna just remind everyone, at Pretty much everything that we talked about today, you can find on developer.cisco.com. And if you don't find it, you can get in touch with us easily through a WebEx team that you can join directly through the website uh, and, and get connected with our team who can help you find out you know, information on anything that you wanna go deeper on. So uh, definitely take advantage of that. We love feedback. We're always planning you know, what kind of resources the community wants to see, what kind of learning they need, what kind of technologies they want to dive into. And we take that feedback really seriously. So please send it our way and, and you can influence, you know, the future of um, how we build out the DevNet resources and programs. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Tony. And um, thank you very much for having us. This was a really fun session. Absolutely. Fantastic. And um, thanks so much to, to yourself, Mandy, and Eric Parr, Richard, our other presenters. Um, yeah, it's, uh, this, I think 
Mandy, you covered most of it for me already, but the, the key um, URL is developer.cisco.com. Um, please go there. It will give you all the information you need. Um, I'll be sending out the recording of this as well. So um, if uh, anybody wants to see that again or review things, um, and so there's loads of different uh, ways that you can reach out to us. Um, yeah, so if there's, if there's any questions, I'm sure there's probably going to be a few after this, but I'll, I'll close this out. There'll also be a poll when I close this, uh, this presentation down. Uh, there'll be a poll there. If you could answer that, it would be very much appreciated. We're always listening, we're always learning, and we're always improving. Um, so, yeah, uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. All right. Cheers, everyone. Thanks so much. It was really fun. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.